Agnes is just joining. Yeah. Do better. Yeah. Check that people outside can hear you. Yeah, I think I did. Um, welcome everybody to um, March um, Health in Hackney. Um, in the chamber, we've got Councillor Turbot de Lorf and Councillor before, and I've had apologies from Helen Woodland, Dr. Husbands, Dr. Coplin, Louise Phillips, and Georgina Dibber. Um, we're shortly going to be joined by uh, Councillor Rathbone, who's returning to the Commission, so welcome. Uh, Councillor Patrick will be joining remotely. Councillor Adebeo, welcome, I can see you all remotely. And Councillor Adams um, will um, be attending slightly late into the chamber. Um, just the usual matters of um, housekeeping. This is obviously a hybrid um, meeting. Please don't start conversations in the chat. Please keep your microphones um, off unless speaking. Um, members of the press may be watching. The, me the meeting is being uh, live streamed and recorded. Um, please keep your camera on um, when it's your item. Um, in terms of declarations of interest um, can i just say at this stage technically councillor colleagues we are in perda um, we have been allowed to continue from the monitoring officer no political statements please um, from anybody um, if you do i'll ask you to withdraw them um, or anything that could be perceived as being a political statement um, and just for myself uh, i think i don't think i technically need to say this but annabelle burns from the homerton who will be joining us i know in a personal capacity um, through our children um with um that then i'm going to move swiftly on to the first item which we sort of added as an emergency item item four in terms of the homerton fertility center and suspension is license um as a welcome and uh, congratulations on your appointment um as the new chief exec of the homerton i understand that's due to take effect um, in, in early course. Obviously, Louise still remains the chief exec. I'm grateful for you attending a um, uh, fairly last minute to um, answer questions in relation to this. Obviously, news broke a few weeks ago of the suspension of the license. We understand that there were um, three separate incidents um, of errors. And as I understand the position, um, no new clients can come forward, but you're still providing services to existing clients. I'll obviously let you um, um, give your presentation in a minute, but I think one of the concerns that I think I've got from a governance point of view um, is at the point that the first incident became aware, where was the risk committee and governance structures and management structures in terms of making sure the latter two incidents didn't happen? um and it, that's clearly a concern across the board because that that, that could indicate the, the failure of processes of, of a wider nature so the extent you're able to deal with that I'd, I'd appreciate some reassurance there and obviously the um the, the, pu the public are looking for reassurance as well so Bazara, over to you thank you can everybody hear me still though we can make you do a little bit louder and jala's going to try yeah. and make you a little bit louder oh Great. You've, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think you've given a bit of an uh, overview about where we were, but if it's OK with you, I'll just kind of do the presentation for all those who may not know. So our fertility units license at the Homerton to operate was suspended on the 8th of March by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, HFEA. The suspension is in place at the moment until um, May this year. And you're right in saying it was a, as a result of three separate incidents which took place in 2023. It's related to the storage of embryos within our unit. Now, all three incidents were report, reported promptly to the HFEA as and when they happened. And we have been working very closely with them to try and identify and understand the cause of those um, incidents themselves. Additionally, um, with all of those incidents, they were reported through our normal governance route and reported to the um, regulators themselves and reported through our normal, we call it STICE, but serious incident reporting system. So there was clear governance and oversight of it and the investigations into them commenced um, immediately. 
Additionally, to work with the, with the HFEA, we've also commissioned three separate independent external investigations to help us identify the cause of these incidents. The first two um, have already commenced. The, um, the third in, um, um, commissioned um, investigation is due to start Im Im imminently, which is about looking at the whole, the first um, two incidents and the third incident itself, so that we can really get to the bottom of what the cause of these incidents are. Um, uh additionally to that we have of course written to um all of our patients apologizing for the distress that we that has been caused um and we are discussing with our patients different treatment options where it's appropriate to do so and we're working with system partners to identify alternative pathways but of course it's still an ongoing investigation in terms of your question around governance i've got breeder joining me today who has been close to me also um there has been good oversight of these incidents. I think where we've got to is just with the um, external investigation that we have got, really getting to the bottom of our identifying the cause of the incident. We have put in place, working with the HFEA, additional above and beyond the normal um, processes or protocols that you would put in place within the um, within a fertility unit to ensure uh, that we are mitigating against any of those kind of incidents reoccurring. So there has been additional uh, mitigations that we have put in place, including working with our staff and the way that the pathways work. So um, clear governance over it, but it's really around making sure that we can complete those investigations and be clear about the cause of of um, of the. Um, the cause of those incidents themselves. I'm going to stop there and ask whether Breeder, I've missed anything, or there's anything else that's needed to be added. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, so, no, Baz, you've covered everything. I think just to clarify, um, so obviously the investigations are ongoing. Um, so, in relation to the incidents, so number one, um, it, we we don't feel there were errors and um, their incidents. So rather than it, it being termed errors, and I think um, initially when we had the first incident, we took all the required um, steps to ensure that we addressed um, and put those mitigations as Baz has has already said. So I think all the steps. So I think that reassurance is really important. To understand that at no point after the first or the second did we not take the appropriate steps. And obviously we were liaising really closely with the HFEA. They had come on site a number of times last year as well to support us and to help ensure that we had the appropriate steps in place to ensure we were safeguarding and supporting our staff and patients throughout the whole process. So I think um, you know, obviously, at, as the investigation proceeds, we, you know, we will be able to come back and give you further information as to, you know, causative factors. But at the moment, the position is that we, we need the third investigation to continue and then we'll be in a better position to understand any causative factors and put additional steps in place if required. But, I mean, a, a few questions here. In terms of three externally commissioned um reviews have you had one and two back yet or not so uh the first investigation has we have the report back and we've obviously um acted on for, upon any of the recommendations from that report we the, the second investigation has been complete but we're just awaiting the final report from the investigator and the third as Baz has already said is about to be commissioned and these are would not be publicly available or they would be so at, at this moment in time, obviously, we're working through um, any the first report has been shared with the people that need to see it. Um, at the moment, we wouldn't be in a position to share those publicly. Um, but as we progress through the rest of the investigations, we should be able to provide some narrative around the findings. At this moment in time, the key bit is to try and ensure that we're pulling all the learning from the three incidents together. And that was all part of the final investigation. And is the regulator conducting their own um, report or review as well, or are they just just say just? Is their action to be to suspend the license, and then that may be unsuspended, but they're not actually conducting their own review? Yes, they're not currently conducting a review. Um, they've supported us to identify the external expert investigators to undertake the reviews. 
I mean, do from a public perspective, um, you can see how, and, and all, I mean, also going forward in terms of recovering confidence in your service, um, you, you can see the difficulty when there isn't sort of complete transparency with, with the findings of the reviews and we haven't got a regulator undertaking their own review and in, the, or in and of itself that sort of could breed a lack of transparency and confidence a, 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 across the whole system. So yeah. are, you, are you in a position to give some sort of undertaking that um, something can be published um, to, to, to provide that transparency? Yes, 100%. Baz, do you want to come in here? Yeah, no, absolutely we can. I think it's very, very important that once we understand the investigation is completed, that we do publish something that at least identifies the cause in the learning and, and tries to build that confidence back again by being able to say what we have put in place as a result of, of those of the um, of the investigation. If there are any recommendations that come out, I think it's important that we share those recommendations and, and be clear about our action plan to recover if that if that's the case. I should say at this point that individual patients that are affected as a result of the investigation are due uh, through our duty of candor are met with and have um, an, uh, we have an open conversation with them about the cause of the incident, where we know what it is and what's gone wrong. So individual patients that are affected, um, uh, we, we are having those conversations with. Just, just dealing with the, the, the personal aspect, have those, I presume, three incidents, I'm making an assumption here, so tell me if I'm wrong, but it's three separate individuals as opposed to the same individual on three occasions. Um, have, if, it, if it is three individuals, have they, I think I saw on one of the reports, they, they've been offered um, a, an, another round or another option of fertility. Are you able to say, obviously, without breaking confidentiality or their names, whether they've um, taken that up with you or taken that up elsewhere? If, if they want to take it up elsewhere because they've less, lost confidence, are you facilitating it to be taken up elsewhere? So I, I think um, just to clarify, so. Uh, I'm not quite sure where the number three patients has 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 come from. There are a number of patients involved, um, and all of the patients have been offered um, the option, and we're supporting patients to move their care elsewhere if that's what they want to do. Um, so I think you know that's all of the as Baz has said, the duty of candor conversations. That's clearly we work through um, the you know the incident with the patient, and clearly have that transparency around what we've learned so far and what steps we've taken and all of the patients are being offered a choice to move treat to their treatment to another centre if that's their choice. And are they being offered treatment if they understandably have lost confidence in the homerton and don't want treatment there are we facilitating it if they wish to have treatment elsewhere? Yes yeah, so we're supporting them I think it, it's it's you know it's it, the there's different scenarios, so it's very difficult to give you a clear answer on, on that particular question because each individual case, there is a different circumstance for each patient and they're on, they're on a different part of the journey. So it's all, you know, the, off, the offer that we're supporting patients with is to suit their particular need um, and we're ensuring that we're facilitating that and giving them and making sure that they that we're meeting, um, you know, as much as we can and, and supporting them to get the best treatment option for them. And just before I open it up to colleagues, um, it was Lu Louise Ashley's, um, uh, I think, letter published. It said three separate incidents, which is, and again, I'm, I, I clearly, I think, have got the wrong then understanding of that because it's three separate incidents. But from what you've indicated, has affected more than three people because of thing. Are you able to say how many people have been affected? Um, so I think we've, uh, you know, I think the numbers um, are where we are working with the patients that are affected. I think mindful of, you know, patient confidentiality and etc. Um, I think what we what we can do is ensure that once we get we continue with the investigation, we we'll provide all that narrative. Um, I'm I'm slightly reluctant to provide exact numbers at this moment in time. Uh, I think we just need to continue with the investigation, and then we'll be able to provide all of that and that narrative and the transparency yeah i mean i i, I don't i can't speaking objectively see how confidentiality is um compromised by giving the number um but i think i'm i'm, I'm not going to 
other colleagues may do but i'm not going to press you on that myself now but i think at some stage we would need yeah. to have um clarity as, as to the scope of this and i think otherwise uh, you know i don't think you're going to be able to move on unless at some stage we yeah. have clear and transparency. we can give you that um confidence that we will be able to provide that but at this moment i don't i think you know we need to ensure we continue with the investigation and then once we have the findings we'll have we will have that ability to be completely transparent and open and have the confidence to give you the numbers that we need to give. Um, um, now, in, in order of which I saw colleagues, Councillor Adebayo, Councillor Rathbone, Councillor Turbot Love. So, Councillor Adebayo. Oh, thank you, Brass, and thank you, Brenda. Um, this is, you know, something very serious. Just uh, the, the, the incident is something very serious. And not knowing the numbers of those who have been affected by this issue is something that worries me at this stage and also those affected is there any emotional support in place for them i like to no. Yes. yes. Um, so all our patients, so any patient going through fertility treatment has got an offer of counselling. We do have that support. So that support is we, we're ensuring that all patients, um, not just patients affected by the incidents, but any patients that we have with that that are on our caseload are being off, given that offer um, of additional support um, from counselling. So there is a there is a proper process, and we're we obviously opened up a helpline immediately after. After, um, you know on the on the Saturday so after the Friday and we've had a, a significant number of patients contact that helpline but also email in to the to the nursing team and to the clinicians and we're ensuring that all patients when they're making contact are being given that offer so we can reassure you that patients are being supported through this process just a quick one sorry chair I'm a therapist myself and just want to know the, the counseling that has been offered uh is it free session and how many sessions so i don't know the detail in relation to how many sessions i know it's definitely free so you know that we're not going to be charging patients for this i think it would be very much dependent on the on the actual case and what's required for each patient but we have committed to offer whatever support is required for those patients using our service Okay. The other thing to kind of add to that is we have also set up multidisciplinary clinics with our clinicians and the team who are there. And there are some patients who have asked for that. So again, if they want another kind of conversation with a senior clinician, that's also an offer for those patients. Thank you. Councillor Rathbone. Um, you're on mute here. Ian, you're still on mute. Sorry, I, I came in a little bit late um, and I forgot to unmute myself. Um, and um, uh, also, um, I'm, as it were, new to health in Hackney, although I have been on in previous years. So I, I don't know who Breeder is. I just wondered who she is. And then I've got a she's, question to She's ask. the chief nurse at the Homerton, Ian. Chief Nurse at the Homerton. Okay, uh, that that um, that helps me. Um, so my question really is, um, what's the reporting mechanism in such situations? Because I first heard about this in the media, um, and then uh, eventually the chair very quickly sent out a holding email. But it was quite some time before found out any anything further other than what was in the media. So I just wondered. What what kind of timelines do you use when you're reporting such situations to partners and others? Do you want me? Do you want me yeah, to uh, do you want to start on that if there's anything? Yeah, no, and I, I you know, I apologise that the first time that colleagues were finding out was in was in the media. We had the plan would was to have had a meeting with the HFEA as part of the final incident, and that meeting was organised. And the plan for that would have been following that meeting where we'd agreed a set of actions 
uh, that comms would have then gone out to stakeholders and partners um, we couldn't unfortunately uh, obviously control um, the the reporting from the media going out at the time that it did but we made every effort as quickly as possible as working through with the HFEA to make sure that we could contact um, affected stakeholders built in into that was also making sure that our priority was as quickly as possible supporting our patients and um, and making sure that we contacted as many of them as we possibly could sorry apologies um, uh, bef um, before the, um, the the media broke so we, we you know so it's just unfortunate when it came out but the normal procedure would have been that we've agreed and we would have communicated it out to um, to, to key stakeholders which we have done but it's just yeah, the alignment was out, unfortunately, and we couldn't, we couldn't, um, what's the word, we couldn't control that. Council Turbot the Lord. Sorry, could I, could I just follow up? Yeah, yeah, um, very quickly, yep. Well, just to say, um, thanks very much for that, but I was actually asking for specific hours uh, and times, you, you've said as soon as possible, do you not have a framework for actually making sure, you know, within six hours of a serious incident, we've informed all, all, all the partners? Sorry. So in terms of a serious incident, and Breda, you might want to come yeah. in here. So there is a serious incident framework and process, and all of those were followed. So I, I'll let Breda explain yeah. it should be better than I will about our serious incidents process. So when we declare a serious incident internally, um, we obviously have a process of governance and, and we get together as a group of MDT and clinicians and we declare a serious incident. Now, that serious incident is reported then, as Baz has said, um, through STICE. So it's reported um, to the national, there's a national database. Um, we then inform our ICB colleagues. So we ensure that the team at the ICB are aware that there's been a serious incident. So there's a very clear timeline. Um, the different difference between this series so we have you know as, a, as any organization any NHS you have serious incidents all the time this is slightly different in in relation to the the um, kind of management of this case and I think the situation that happened was that we were we were dealing with these incidents internally we had notified the, the right people so the regulator we'd notified the ICB so we had done all the you know all the right processes had been followed and we had obviously put in immediate actions in place uh, as well following the first and the second incident and then we had the third incident so I think that in relation to notifying partners we wouldn't generally notify partners of serious incidents but this particular case is very different in as much as the the regulator then took a decision to um to to kind of pause our or, you know to revo revoke our license and that then was a situation then that that then kind of got some media interest and i think that kind of that process then of when we were med aware on friday morning about the license and when we were med aware that there was media interest we did we the timeline we had from notifying our patients and notifying partners was was less than six hours so i think we were in a position where we were then having to act extremely quickly to to safeguard our patients because i think ultimately that was they were the most important people that we wanted to make contact with um and with that was our focus on friday i'm afraid and, and we apologize for that and obviously any of these incidents we learn and we and we reflect on and that's what we will do as a, as an exec and as an organization we will reflect on how we manage that immediate step and i think the key focus for us on friday was to ensure that our patients were informed as soon as we possibly could so we put all our energy into doing that. But I do know that Louise, our CEO, did reach out and inform um, key people. And then the messaging went from there. So, you know, there was a delay. And, uh, and obviously we would, you know, we would want to ensure everybody's informed in, in an appropriate time. But Friday, our focus was to ensure our patients were informed and that we were trying to manage that and clearly set up a process to support our patients. Um, I'm going to counsel the with the law. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, following up, thank you, it's been really, really helpful. Um, just following up on service users, how, what has been the response so far from service users in general? Have you had many asking to move to another clinic because of lo loss of confidence? Um, and how are you managing that as well? Because I would imagine that that would mean extra work for your team as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, no problem. So, so I think um, 
so I think overall our patients have been extremely supportive um, and I think a lot of patients have um, you know uh, you know they've been messages of support clearly our license is only um, revoked until May so our whole aim is that we will get you know we will get our license back and that we'll be able to start treating our patients again so I think at the moment you know we have had a number of patients um, asked for transfer of care but a lot of our patients are just asking you know when is the license going to come back and also you know just to provide some support to the team as well so i think overall the numbers of patients currently that have asked for a transfer of care are low um because our, our whole aim is to ensure that we get our license back and that we can start treating our patients as soon as possible um councillor before Yeah, thanks. Um, you stated here that you have uh, taken some actions, following actions in place, which includes all staff now working pairs to ensure all clinical activities are checked by two healthcare professionals. You also said um, you have rechecked all competence of staff within the unit. And the thirdly, you also said you have increased the security and access point in the unit. Um, my question is that, what was your findings from the competence check and why is security unit check uh, issues, uh, uh, can be issues, and, and what, how can you explore on that, on those uh, security issues and, and the competence findings? So, so I think the, com the competency of all our staff, I think it was we, we wanted to reassure ourselves that all our staff are um, how competent to do what the procedures that they need to do. So that was that was a blanket approach after our first um, and second essay. Sorry, there's a really big hole. Um, and then our, our security is to ensure that, this, that we're, we've done all the right things so that the unit is safe and that our, our staff are working in pairs. Security is a really complex area. Two embryologists working together is support for them, but also we're ensuring that we've that the checks that they need to do that they are as robust as they need to be. So I think we've put all in additional actions just to reassure ourselves, but also to ensure that that we are um, taking all the right precautions and the right steps to to ensure that the safety of this of the of the staff, but also of the patients and and the treatment that we're providing. I think I think just speaking objectively, I think the, the third point in particular about that being a, a response sort of does, in many ways, beg more questions than it that it sort of answers because I think people's yes, and, that and, and that and that's fair enough. But as as we've said, the investigation is ongoing, um, and I think once we have completed the investigation, clearly, you know, we will be able to provide that detail. But I think at the moment the investigation is ongoing, so we can't we can't surmise and and you, we just need to ensure that that process happens. Um, but I think what we what we're here to do and what we want to do for our patients is to ensure that um, we we're providing the assurance that we have taken all the right steps to ensure we've done the right thing. Councillor Adams, thank you, Chair. I was just wondering, so you said uh, you might get your license back in um, May. If you don't get it back, if you don't get your license back in May, what happens next? So I can take that, Breed, if that's okay. That's that's what we are, what we are actively working through that at the moment, um, between the Homerton, the HFEA, and um, our stakeholders in the, in, in the ICB to make sure that we have a plan B, that we've got alternative options in place. So all of that is part of the work that we're doing um, at the Homerton. We're happy to share that with you um, once that's all confirmed or finalised, but that's, that's the conversation that we're having at the moment to make sure that, that patients can still access the service that they, that they require. Um, thank you. Um, we're at time. I can see I've got two at least asking for a second round of questions. Three now asking for a second round of questions. I think we, th th this is, I, I, I wanted to keep this to half an hour. So we've got a lengthy item in terms of estate. I appreciate that it is um, a very sensitive area. We've given it half an hour. And what I'm going to do is ask for it to come back um, at the point that you are able to um, 
publish and give us more details following the third investigation, which should be around um, just after May, I hope, presumably that's the period when you're looking for your license to be um, reactivated. So it may be that we can, I can schedule it now for the first meeting we have back in June um, for, for, an, for a timely update that we, that we can then get. Uh, with Baz, do you think that would be realistic in terms of if you're working towards May, you would hope to have that third report um, um, be aware of the findings by May, June and be able to give us more details at that stage? So, I, sorry, and um, there's feedback. I think it's absolutely reasonable and realistic for us to come back in May to give you a real life update in terms of where we are with the license. I couldn't confirm at the moment that we would have the outcome of the third investigation. It's just been commissioned with the terms of reference. It really will depend on the um, the external the findings of the uh, of the external investigator and um, how much time what they find and how much time they think that they need uh, but we, I think it's reasonable for us to come back and if there's any key headlines even from um, from what they're finding that we can share we'll absolutely share that so yeah let's come back in May I think it's reasonable it's, 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 we're, we're in Perth just to be it's 19th of June so 19th of June is our next meeting so if we can let, yeah. let's shut Let's schedule it in for an update on where we are. And I think from our um, from our point of view, I think the only thing we can sort of, pending further details, is that just to impress upon governance terms, that if there are similar incidents, even in other areas, that one incident is a red flag. Um, because I think probably the, the biggest concern, as I said at the outset, is that there have been three separate ones here. Um, and I think that that because then that really brings in questions on governance framework that why things aren't being acted on on incident one. So I, I think I, obviously I don't know there's any similarity between the three incidents at the moment, and obviously that that could that's personal to that point, but it, it does cause issues. And obviously we're we're very proud of Hamilton, and we you know we want you to succeed. Um, but part of our role in that is is really seeking to hold you to account that even when one incident is occurring in any of your areas that your risk committee your processes are double down um to, to, to conduct thorough reviews yeah um, that's if you want to say anything before i draw the item to a close yeah i suppose i just wanted to leave you with the final thoughts around that i can uh, definitely assure you right now that our local governance process for managing serious incidents uh, are absolutely robust. It is how we have identified these incidents themselves. I think when the final report comes down, we share with you the findings. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to uh, give you that additional uh, assurance about how the incidents are, are linked, but very, very cautious of waiting for that final incident that gives us more information that, that, that we can give you. But I do just want to assure you the reason why we've identified the three incidents is because our local processes for identifying incidents, identifying calls, and then really promptly working with the regulators to, um, to uh, notify them of them, for them to come in and for us to start putting actions in place are absolutely robust. I accept and appreciate the complexity of this particular one um, is um, is not straightforward. So I don't want to, you know to leave people, uh, colleagues in the room or uh, members in the room that 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 uh, that these are incidents that we weren't aware of or were blindsided by because that's absolutely not the case. And um, they were identified in real time, dealt with in real time. This is now about really investigating the cause of them so that we can make sure that we put any additional necess necessary steps in place if they are required. But we'll come back in um, in June and hopefully we'll have more information for you then. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, thank you, colleagues. I took one round from everybody who wants to ask a question. So I, I think, um, bearing in mind we're coming back in June, we'll give it we'll give it more space there um, as well. So uh, and thank you uh, both for coming at short notice um, to answer questions and hold yourselves to account um, on, on this area. I appreciate that. Um, so with that, I'll then draw that item to a close and move on to essentially the substantive item. Um, on the agenda, which is item number five, which is the estate strategy, which primarily focuses on out of hospital GP um, care. Um, I'm going to sort of structure this, if I can, by way of four 
separate presentations, probably interspersed by questions just to keep the, the flow of the meeting. So, and I'll, I'll introduce the relevant presentees for each of those items rather than go through a long list now. Um, um, the first area we're going to hear from is NHS North East London and Hackney colleagues um, from the NHS in terms of the uh, strategic options and also where we're, we're currently sitting in terms of um, the state's work. The, the second element would be to hear from the neighbourhood and the primary care networks team, possibly in terms of relation to their asks and their needs um, with, 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 with their evolving and, and increased capacity. The third area will be to hear from Hackney Council colleagues as to um, how we have and could in the future possibly support um, a state's work. And then fourthly, I'll bring in colleagues um, from the Homerton on perhaps a slightly different slant to the, the, the primary care out of hospital to just try and get an update possibly on where we are, if anywhere, with St Leonard's, um, but also in terms of um, the, the estate's work that was previously planned prior to COVID and, and any updates we have there. Um, so with the, the, the first of those areas then is from um, primary care colleagues, both locally um, and on a um, North East London footprint. So we welcome William Cunningham Davis, who's joining us online as the Director for Delivery for Primary Care. Welcome, um, William. We're joined uh, locally uh, by our two um, leads, Kirsten Brown from a clinical perspective, and R Richard Bull, I think, in your, your, in your f final week uh, um, um, from what was the CCG and now the um, uh, ICB. Um, I don't know how, because I've got two presentations. I've got one on a more strategic um, approach, and then I've got uh, there's, there's one in the there's one in the pack um, on a three page, which gives more granularity in terms of specific sites. So I don't know whether in a minute, if I hand over to maybe William um, to maybe for you to maybe uh, speak to the the, the the higher level strategic document. Oh no, Kirsten, to speak to the higher level strategic document. Well, I was going to start us off, if that's all right, okay. um, giving a bit of a... Well, then, just before I do then, and just before I hand over to you, um, can I just take this moment to actually thank Richard, because I know that is your final week. Um, you've been a consistent member of um, attending to this committee, and um, you're going to be greatly missed across the season. I'm speaking to numerous colleagues who've echoed that, and I think we're very concerned you know, with the new structure that essentially we're losing people like you with the knowledge of every practice in this in this borough and that adds enormous value. Um, so thank you um, from all of us. I know you've done other community work in Hackney as well. So uh, from all of us here, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, so I will start um, talking about primary care estates um, from the point of view of a GP. Um, I'm a GP at Spring Hill Practice and um, the clinical lead for general practice at primary care in City and Hackney. And then I'll pass over to Richard to go into some more detail about the primary care estates um, situation um, and Sadie will talk later on around the neighbourhood's perspective. As I have mentioned previously in this meeting, um, there is a clear national drive to push care from the hospital into the community closer to the patient where appropriate, which I would fully support. Um, but I believe that the finances and the infrastructure need to follow the patient care so that we can deliver this vision for our patients. Um, for years, primary care estates have not been adequately funded um, and many of us are operating out of buildings which aren't fit for purpose and we have outgrown. We in City and Hackney have a wonderful workforce um, in general practice with a good number of GPs, um, particularly compared to other areas of NEL. And we've got increasing numbers of new clinical roles, which I also discussed when, we were, when I was here last. But um, unfortunately, our inadequate estates are now acting as a barrier for us hiring new staff and enabling the vision of integrated neighbourhood teams, which Sadie will outline. On that, though, there are, there are positives. 
Um, and as Richard will outline, there has been collaborative projects between the council and the then CCG, um, by which the council have built two new buildings for local practices to work in, which will be opening soon. And that's down to the huge work of Richard um, and, and David and colleagues um, to make that happen. And we're hugely appreciative of that. So I think we need to build on these examples of excellent practice. Uh, we need to work together to utilize the community spaces we have in Hackney to be used by our neighborhood teams for the benefits of all our residents for health reasons and other, um, other reasons as well. So on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Richard um, to talk in a bit more detail about some of the primary care estate works that have been happening locally. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you um, for handing over, Kirsten. Um, so I will give some more local detail, um, and I will touch on, sorry, and I will also touch on um, estates from a North East London perspective as well. Um, so yes, more on the local context. So um, just to remind everybody that estates is an, an enabler, um, it's to enable service delivery. Um, so the need for estates is dictated by service needs. You know, it's it's not the um, the tail wagging the dog here. Um, it's about um, what patients need and it's about services. And there, as Kirsten has already alluded to, there are lots of um, key challenges. I think it's um, you know, a bit of a tautology really to say <laughs> that the NHS has not been very good in terms of um, estates the capital budget is very small we have a huge revenue budget but in proportion the capital budget is tiny um in a in a webinar recently for um for people that work in primary care a senior national clinical lead did say <laughs> there is no estates for primary care uh, there, there are no solutions for um, primary care estates problems that's not strictly true i think she was saying that slightly um tongue-in-cheek maybe after a long day <laughs> um and we can evidence some successes locally but there are huge problems and we should not take those problems lightly um there are many complexities in relation to estates. Um, one, one complexity is just the number, the diversity um, of estate ownership. Um, so we know that NHS property services um, took over um, primary care trust, um, PCT estates assets um, when PCTs came to an end. We have private landlords locally, um, either with or without the involvement of NHS property services. Um, we have community health partnerships. We have Homerton as landlord for primary care locally. We have London Borough of Hackney as landlord. And um, there are many other um, landlords out there. So it is a very complex landscape. The rules that govern primary care premises are myriad and woefully out of date now we've been promised for a very long time probably as long as i've been working in primary care now, uh, that the premises cost direction is a set of rules that govern um, primary care premises are due for updating and um, we are told that is imminent imminent but we've been told that very soon we've also been told that um don't hold on to your hats that's, that's going to um, solve all the problems um because it's not um, in terms of complexities, there is no clear agreement on what the, um, the right answer is um, for the service need question. Um, the, the need um, changes over time, it changes in relation to um, developments of um, the clinical model in terms of digital aspects, um, and that will continue to develop, um, which adds to the complexity uh, at some point at some point you just have to draw a line in the sand if you're going to build a new a new set of premises you need to say right that's the model we need to go for it but the model will continue to change um local authorities is we've got a lot to talk about i uh, will come on to the detail in relation to working with local authorities but there are different appetites um in local authorities in terms of their um ability to um, include health in section 106 and um, civil planning um we've as 
Kirsten has already alluded to, we've seen a massive expansion uh, of practice teams recently via the establishment of primary care networks, and um, those that um, that has come with no additional estates funding. So all those staff know where we need to put them, uh, which is why uh, practices are absolutely bursting at the seams. They were already bursting at the seams, but they're now even more bursting at the seams. Um, PCNs, they want to find their own solutions. They see um, empty estates in the communities. They feel very frustrated that they can't um, take on those estates. They say, we haven't got the budgets. Well, actually, primary care networks probably have more um, funding available, free, unallocated money than anybody else. But how, But that is really for other purposes. That is for tackling uh, health inequalities, not for plugging um, the, the estates gaps that we've, in, um, that, uh, we've inherited. So I'll stop there and talking about some of the sort of, you know, the, the wider contextual stuff and um, focus now on what we've been doing. Some of the, um, some of the success we've had in City and Hackney. So um, to start, this is about um, partnership working with London Borough of, ha uh, London Borough of Hackney. We've had a, a section 256 agreement with LVH now for quite a few years that we just um, fairly recently come to an end that enabled um, two joint posts to um, help develop um, primary, well, estates broadly, but um, particularly primary care estates in City and Hackney, uh, with some notable successes. I don't want to steal all of David Burrell's thunder because I can <laughs> see him up there on the screen and he will come and talk about um, what we've been doing together uh, when it's his turn. So I won't, I won't go through um, everything that I've shared in the pack. Um, but we've had some, some of the successes I'll pull out is um, moving WIC practice out of very substandard accommodation and into Kenworthy Road, which was a purpose-built GP practice, well, it's a purpose-built health centre. The ground floor was built for um, general practice, but it was empty for a very long time, very many years, which was an absolute crime. And we were calling, the NHS was continuing to pay rent on that space. So we managed to get them out of their old, very, very shabby building into something much better. And they are much happier. They are much happier there. The patients like it and uh, the staff like it. It helps with um, staff morale and it helps with recruitment and retention. Um, I will. I have to mention the two big capital projects, uh, Portico and Belfast Road. Kirsten mentioned them, and David will mention them. They are fantastic, um, fantastic developments, and they're uh, very, very soon they will be ready for occupation, uh, and that is fantastic. That's the first. They're the first two um, big general practice new buildings we've had in City and Haney for over ten years since Kenworthy Road was built. So um, that is that is great news. And then um, I won't be much longer. Business case for additional space. So where practices can take on additional space, we will listen to um, that, their cases for that and approve where we can. Um, those those cases quite often come with additional um, rent implications. So you know the NHS reimburses um, practices for the um, for the rent they use. So we do have to take that in consideration. But we have been able to um, approve um, quite a long list there of um, additional spaces for practices. We do have a big. We do have a project in the in the in the wings again. Um, this is part of the collaborative work with London Borough of Hackney, and this is about relocating the greenhouse practice out of its current super constrained um, building into um, refurbished um, accommodation, multi-agency, um, repurposed local authority accommodation. So um, great for the local authority, great for health, um, but that's that's taken, a, it's been on a bit of a back burner, partly because of um, ICD funding um, issues. Um, and then lastly, um, I'll talk about London Improvement Grants. So um, there is a budget available, uh, a limited budget available, um, mostly on an annual basis for practices to apply to, to improve their premises. Uh, Kirsten's practice has um, availed itself of that most recently to do some internal reconfiguration. Um, and that funding provides two thirds of the funding for internal works or um, extensions, but the practice has to contribute a third themselves. So um, for relatively small projects, most practices can manage that themselves, but bigger, pra bigger projects, sometimes practices really do struggle. And there's one example locally of a GP practice where they're desperate for more space. They applied and won an improvement grant, quite a substantial improvement grant, over a million pounds. 
but unfortunately they couldn't see it through to um, completion. So in the end, they had to give that money back. So that was a real missed opportunity. But though this quantum of those grants has gone now, I understand. I think the money is really um, is coming down in in quantum, and it'll only really be available for smaller smaller um, uh, initiatives. Just on that last point, it is one of the main blockages there because essentially in that example you gave, um, the, 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 the practice would have themselves have to stump, stump up one third yeah. of what would be the one point five. That is always yeah. going to be a exactly. challenge. That is always going to be a challenge given that the, the funding that GP practices get is spent on care by and large. Yeah. So there's a, there's a structural problem, as it were, with the LIG grant, as it were, because unless it's a quite a small amount that the practices would have to be able to fund you're just not going to be able to realistically fund a major a major piece of work that's, and then, that's exactly right because if you, you know if you look at what we're doing at the lawson practice when we're converting we're, the partnership is taking out a bank loan to, to finance that it's a huge it's a huge investment and other practices with its bigger amounts of money they, there's not we don't have money sitting around to do that gps take on all the risk and the extra work of that extra borrowing to see it through as well so that's a huge, a huge ask for people who are essentially clinicians and who want to see yes i, I can. so um can i just press you um um before so I, I want to just throw it open for a few questions and then i'll move on to the the pcm presentation i just want to ask a few questions and i'll throw it open to members um the blockage if i can call it that word for greenhouse yes. moving to well street i mean without being too sort of internally nhs pol political to say you know if this was still in ccg sphere would it now be progressing but because budgets have gone upwards um there's a lack of control and there's a member of the icb over there um, <laughs> um the, 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 that essentially this is this is a problem the lack of the devolution of funds and decision making and that really you know, there's a, there's a structural problem there in, in the ICB setup that's an, not enabling good things to happen at a local level. Well, it's tempting to say yes, but I can't, can't categorically say that the block is because of the situation you've just described, or as tempting as it is to say that is the case. Um, we are aware um, City and Hackney budgets might be under similar pressure uh, under the current circumstances. It's quite hard to sort of say categorically what situation we would be in now if we were still um, independent and had control of City and Hackney finances. If we, if we can just delve into the granularity, I mean, so I don't know if, if, if this commission can sort of um, um, assist trying to move that project forward, because as I understand it, what the core capital the funding the project tell me if i'm wrong has been agreed but the the issue is the revenue stream that the ics would then have to pay is a bit more than is currently being paid and that's the that's the budgetary blockage so it's not the capital cost of actually the refurb and the move but it's the uplift in the annual rental amount that ultimately falls to the IC, the ultimately force the ICB, is that the blockage? Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit more rent, probably about 80k a year more, but also a little bit of um, call on ICB capital. But there has been a block on approving any new spend at the ICB level for the last six months. The double lock or whatever the decision that's been made because of the thing. So in essence, so even if we were to sort of, lobby is the wrong word, but make representations, the issue is we're constrained by the ICS, the ICB finances because of the double lock agreement, Indeed. which is essentially just for members that that's an agreement whereby um, because the, there's, uh, because of the concerns of the finances at ICS level, everything then has to be agreed by an, a sort of an independent someone's been brought in um, to, to oversee any, any expenditure over 50,000 or whatever, what, 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 what have you. So that so the, the, the wider blockage is the wider sense of the ics finances on it as to why we can't move it forward at the moment and it is i do understand it is moving through some new form of governance now um it's quite unclear i have to say 
what the exact governance is for um, projects of this description, but I understand it is going to a committee at some point. Um, so things are things are happening now post um, that six month block on um, on approval. So hopefully it can now motor through. Um, I've, I've got a few more questions, but I want to open it up. So members' questions, sort of more for our primary care colleagues. Um, in City and Hackney on City and Hackney Estates, are, are there any, are there any um, questions? So I can, I can, I can carry. So but then, can, can you just explain then, um, just in a little bit more, Richard, how it's worked then, of how we've managed to have these that I know um, David and others will speak to um, in a bit more detail in a minute. These success stories in Hackney. So number one, there was an agreement essentially by two five six to fund hosts to actually carry the ring hold the ring and drive this stuff forward so that 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 was point one as to how we've made it happen point two though on the capital because if if say the portico and belfast road weren't funded through london improvement grants can you just give us some background as to how we managed to get the capital funding in place for them um and that gives us some idea as to how it could be done in the future Okay, it might be a good idea just to bring David in at this point um, so he can speak from the council side because ultimately that was a council um, decision and he can he can talk to that. David, can I just bring you in prematurely at, the, at this stage? Can you just explain how the capital element was reached then for those two for those two properties? Essentially, has the council almost volunteered some land but with an agreement that it gets money back through rent over a period of time so, david we had you and then we lost you uh chris yeah um nope he's there <laughs> my my apologies chair of of all the evenings my broadband appears to be playing up um yeah, so uh, essentially, uh, uh, so, yes, the, the, the council paid all the capital and uh, recovers the capital over a, a, a 30 year period um, through, through the rental, which is agreed with the district valuer. And so then, and so if on that model, what so it requires some up capital from the council, and we're prepared to accept the repayment over a 30 year period. But from NHS colleagues, the way it works is presumably you're prepared to pay a bit higher rent often than maybe you were in the old premises, sometimes, but maybe not. I don't know because of the, the, the way. Uh, the rent is assessed on our behalf by the district valuer. That's not our decision. Um, he takes an assessment of um, the rental value and um, uh, value for money. Someone's got to pick up the tab. If it's more, we are picking got... up. The ICB is picking up the tab. Maybe. Yeah. So, so, so the point the point is that what, where it's financially disadvantaged, where where it could cost the NHS more in crude terms, is if if the, the district valuer judges the rent to be more than it was previously paid. And so, hence, that's why there may be some sort of anxiety in, in tight budget terms to sort of say yes to more of these projects. Is that is that sort of like one of the, the sticking elements from an NHS side? Do you think that's certainly going to be the case going forward? I think under the under the current um, financial climate at the time when um, when we did our own assessment, um, we did we deemed that that increase in rent was affordable to the local uh, primary care budget. And was a good investment and we stand by that but now obviously with essentially that decision having gone up a level then there are other budget constraints there Kristen, do you want to come in there yeah so i think that's absolutely right so we will the these new buildings will have more rent because they are bigger in size so though that rent gets paid that that rent comes to the practice who then pays rent to the council in this the landlord in this case um this is it is I think we all need to be pushing and explain exactly like I said at the beginning that with care moving from into the community, unless these sort of projects are realized, the vision cannot happen. 
Um, and I think that that's what it needs to be heard at all levels, whether that's at an ICB level or at NHS England level, because if, that, if that's what the, the vision is, then the only way to make that happen is to invest in primary care and invest in these buildings um, and so that we can make primary care solid, but also progress the work with the integrated neighbourhood teams, because you'll hear from Sadie that it's very difficult to progress because there's nowhere to put these into, you know, there's no, we can't put people together in a, in a place. Um, and there, there are other ways of working, of course, but co-location is, is, is an important part of that. Yes. Um, Councillor Patrick? Darren, you're on mute. Um, and, you know, Can you hear me now? Not you, but there's some feedback in the background. Hang on. That we also talk about, You've got the news um, on. Literally, yeah. Uh, right, food and all of those sorry. kind of areas, um, we are... We forget it, I'll come as, back. As sorry. I can't mute the other thing. All right, okay. Yes, it mutes. Um, thanks, Yes, yeah, so, so in other words, what you're saying is all the... I mean, there's a lot of talk, even at ICF level, about wanting to keep people out of hospital about primary care where possible but the point you're making is that we've got to have the buildings to be able to do it in the first place to even retain staff and make this work so if you want to really make this happen you've got to yeah okay um thank you uh councillor adams well i just push on this for you or not i don't know but i'll say it if it's for you then you answer it if not <laughs> how does the capital location work in the NEL and where does city and acne primary care fit into current North London uh, priorities? Yes, do you want me to repeat it? I can repeat that. Yeah. Can you repeat? Yes, my question is how does the capital allocation work in the NEL? And where does the city and acne primary care fit into current notice London priorities? So how does the capital allocation work at NEL? And how does city and hackney work in terms of current priorities? So I suppose in other words, if if other areas are other areas benefiting more from capital allocation than city and hackney is right now? Possibly. So I mean um, William may want to come in on this point, or Rich, if I said, but I do know that the capital allocations for North East London um, compared to other areas is low um, for various reasons. No, for North East London. Um, how much of that's coming to primary care? I think we, we don't know, but I suspect very little, considering the pressures. Um, there are other there are other areas um, who are top slicing their capital allocations and saying that a, a percentage of 5% will go to primary care, that that's not happening in now. Um, so, so in terms of what the priority, what, how, what about City and Hackney? Well, you know, that's part, it's more about what's primary care overall. And I think that budgets being so tight, my sense is it's primary care is not high on the agenda. Um, William, are you able to um, come in and give us some idea what is it? NEL's capital budget per year and, and what percentage is going to primary care? So, Chair, thanks very much. Um, apologies, I'm not able to give you the exact figure, but um, primary care, unfortunately, has, has always received a, a smaller amount of, of capital funding um, anyway. A lot of the funding that comes for primary care or for new developments is, is often via Section 106 or SIL funding and working with your colleagues um, in the planning team. That's historically the kind of one of the the main kind of routes to to new builds, uh, obviously to meet the new patient um, kind of cohort, uh, or, or that's normally deemed why why, why they get the section one hundred six or SIL funding. Um, but again, primary care has it's normally the most of most of NHS England's um, financial capital fund normally focuses on on new builds of hospitals, etc. Um, so, so primary care, uh, it, it doesn't doesn't get the the same level of funding um, that that the acutes do. But I mean, I, I appreciate things like the new hospital program or what have you. That is like yeah, treasury backed, and there'll be that 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 requires national input, etc. Et but does but I would have thought 
that um, North East London ICS itself still has a capital allowance. So, the, so I, suppose the, the, I suppose the question that Kirsten's rightly sort of framing is that, well, what is it and what percentage is primary care getting and why isn't it getting a more proportionate share, bearing in mind the vision is more should be done at primary care. So I, I appreciate, you know, you, you may not have that, um, those figures to hand, but I think it does, it does beg a question of sort of overall a, a, a approach. Uh, Councillor Kennedy, is that a hand going up? Um, it, it is a hand going up because we've been very clear at NEL um, uh, ICB, so that's that's a board level, but we are undercapitalized um, as a region, um, especially when you look at the growth we've experienced during the course of the last uh, 20 years. That's about, about half a million population increase in NEL since 2001, and we're expecting about another 300, 350,000 population increase um, in the area, which, which makes NEL the fastest growing in terms of population ICS in the entire country, but we're not receiving um, a capital allowance that reflects that growth. Um, and that's one of the things that um, uh, at chief executive level talking to NHS England, uh, we're really pushing. I'll bring Councillor Adebayo in a second, but just on, on, on the, even though we're undercapitalized, just as a percentage of how it's being divvied up, within patch between primary care and secondary care is some focus being done on is that a fair and just um split um yes we're looking at it but remember um in terms of what we've got coming in it's constantly changing we're never entirely sure what we've got as a capital allowance from year to year and actually when you are looking at section 106 and SIL, you're talking about negotiations with um, seven local authorities, um, uh, eight if you include uh, the corporation, um, who've all got changing um, priorities as well. So you um, and other pulls on those assets. Um, Councillor Annabelle, just trying to clarify one thing. Did you say that you are not eligible to tap into session one or six? Uh, we approached London Borough of Hackney recently for some um, SIL Section 106 funding uh, for the two capital projects which was supported. Um, well, it was guaranteed locally, um, uh, but on the basis that the funding would come from the ICB. But we did ask and it was supported locally. In other words, the, the, the two capital projects in that we, we're talking about in terms of the Portico and Belfast Road, that was coming from 106 money, but that's, that depends upon the local authority agreeing to, to allocate that money for that purpose, and that might not be the same, for example, for every other local authority, is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. This was specifically about some of the additional costs in terms of moving the practices in, so um, buying equipment and furniture and um, other other things to kit out the new builds which the practices um really cannot afford hmm. chair can i ask you this question please if you don't please do. is there any other grant that you, you can tap into and how can the local authority support you in terms of this capital project because this is very important especially with the outcome that you've presented to us tonight it seems it's very important that we have continuity with this project in the community. Thank you. I think, I mean, two clear ways for me is to keep the collaborative working that we've started with, with these two projects and see if there are opportunities to, to do further work like this. I think that'd be number one. Um, and then the number two, I would say is, um, thinking about our community buildings um, and the assets we have in the community and how we can utilize them. And this is not just primary care, but this is where, where the neighborhoods team comes in because there are there's, there's lots of work that could be happening in these community spaces, um, but 
you know, when they, when money needs, you know, be, we're being asked, I mean, I think and PCNs, neighbourhoods would be asked to, to pay rent on that. And that's where the difficulty comes because where that where's that money coming from? So I think where where there is opportunities and where there are spaces which are not being utilised fully, you know, I think that all the PCNs, all the neighbourhoods would really um, would would love to utilise those spaces for patients, for residents, um, and some of the services that we could offer. So you're saying a, a step down from sort of big projects is that even if there are just spaces that are just not being used. That, 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 that it's not so neat to have a bespoke consultation room. You don't need it. You just need a physical space at some point. What you're Absolutely, for group work, um, for for bringing for, for bringing teams together, for for um, community projects. Um, I think all the the the, the PCNs and the neighbourhoods um, would would really would love that opportunity. Well, I mean, we can, I think we can come back to that point maybe um, on, on on the Hackney element or, or later. Um, I, was, I did see Councillor Patrick, but she's gone there, so I'll, I'll leave it. So with that then, I think that neatly segues into the um, the PCN um, presentation. So Sadie, are you going to um, um, speak to that? And I suppose, I think one thing looking through your presentation that sort of came to me is sort of the, the, the what council colleagues or what others might need is a clear ask, a clear, specific, and I appreciate Richard's point that it's always changing and what have you, but at some point, as he says, you've got to... <laughs> so what is the clear ask, say, from the PCNs in the neighbourhoods, and what does that look like? And then once there is that plan in place, then that can almost be given to colleagues to work towards. Thank you. Um, so, yes, there are lots of challenges around um, space. Um, we do need to move towards co-location and delivering services in community settings. I think everybody knows that the PCNs would really welcome everyone coming in. They are at the heart of the neighbourhood, but they don't have the space. Um, despite the challenges, I think, um, and I'm going to present here, there's a lot of work that we plan to do over the next year together. So um, I've provided quite a detailed slide pack that builds on the overview that I gave at the last meeting with some linked research and mapping that we're doing. So I'm just going to go over some key messages around um, neighbourhoods and um, estates planning. Um, it's important to go back to the context where we are so and what was agreed in City and Hackney. And in 2020, City and Hackney agreed a model for neighbourhoods. And that set out a long programme of work leading to the establishment of eight core neighbourhood teams, working with people with long-term conditions and complexity. The idea was that these would be matrix teams and they would be co-located with a shared caseload. And this team could vary according to population health needs, but the core team, um, as in many teams we see around the country, would comprise of community nurses, probably mental health, adult community therapies, adult social care, social workers. Um, and around that, a wider neighbourhood team, um, which is more of a, net, a network with secondary care expertise, prevention services and community navigators. Things have changed since 2020, namely COVID, um, uh, which is when uh, City and Hackley established the um, complex MGMs, which have been very successful. Um, the development of a neighbourhood networks and ways of working is really quite advanced in City and Hackney. And um, you know, many teams are holding caseloads around neighbourhoods, working with the PCNs. There's a range of MGM working taking place. And over the past year, there's really been a sea change in aligning children's services around these geographies as well, not to mention um, leadership groups really being established in each um, PCN or neighbourhood area. So that means we are reviewing, because of all these changes, it means we are reviewing um, really how uh, we agreed to take forward this traje trajectory in the next steps. So in the research that I outlined, um, you can see that some areas are going more with 
okay, we have neighborhood networks and we work together around certain pathways and others have these core co-located neighborhood teams. I don't think we have completely established which way that we are going and we're, we're doing that consultation now. Either way, we need space to do this work in. So we really do need um, estates. So um, the reason we need estates is uh, to really embed the core pillars of neighbourhoods working, which are knowing your residents, um, having services closer to home for people and for different, um, different kinds of staff to know each other and to really be focused in on those population health approaches and the, the population health needs and the particular health inequalities. So in the slide pack, I've given an example of a pilot that's happening this year with adult community rehabilitation team. So they are moving into community space and they, uh, with some of their assessments. So currently they do, they assess some clients who are more mobile at St. Leonard's and they're moving into a community setting and their, their aim is to reduce waiting times and to um, expose patients to more um, to other relevant services and activities, such as the navigators, other care coordinators, voluntary sector activities. So in um, the approach that I've described, um, the vision is really to establish in each neighborhood, maybe some neighborhoods will share some kind of known, shared, recognized neighborhood hub for staff and residents to have a shared space um, for the core activities of neighbourhoods working. And that those core activities are currently the complex MDMs, the neighbourhood forums, the leadership groups, the staff meetings, lots and lots of co-production activities, um, lots of groups working around service improvement, anti-racist service design, um, and for staff, to have hot desking space, ideally, and to do assessments such as the um, rehabilitation team are wanting to do. And the way we are approaching it is through our new leadership groups. Um, so um, currently these leadership groups are working on health inequalities projects with a range of partners. So they're mostly PCN led, but some of them are really sharing that leadership. Um, so it's already bubbled up in the first few rounds of those meetings. What about the space? How can we co-locate? How can we have a, a sort of known space where residents feel unstigmatized, where they're comfortable and um, where we can work together? So um, this year we're recruiting a new dedicated estates um, manager. Uh, who will be a band seven role who will work uh, with the central neighbourhoods team and the PCNs and um, the NEL um, team that will support around um, an estate strategy. And with each leadership group, they, they, they will do a process of like unlocking the neighbourhood for estates. So they'll create an estates plan for each of the neighbourhoods. And um, from that, we'll create an overarching strategy for the neighbourhoods programme. Uh, would that be dovetail in tandem with each of the PCN leads? So essentially it's one per PCN and, and neighbourhood proposal that's being put forward? Yes. Yeah, so um, the it will cut. So it will be very locality based. So we'll, you know, from two angles, a city in Hackney neighbourhoods um, estate strategy, including um, ICT elements as well, which go along with it. But each neighbourhood has different needs and different assets. So it needs to be a bottom up approach. So it need, it will be led by the leadership groups. So there'll be a plan for each neighbourhood. There'll be pilots for each neighbourhood um, and an overarching strategy to take forward. And th th then what's going to be proposed for each neighbourhood? Is that going to be a core making use of the assets you've currently got? Or is that going to be part one of it? it, it and then is it going to be part two, which is an ask or a suggestion about what more you need? I mean, how, how, yes. how does it look? What's it going to look like? I think it's going to look like mapping the needs of each neighbourhood 
looking at common themes across what we can't, you know, the challenges that we have. There'll be challenges around, um, yeah, accessing uh, local community spaces, having an agreed partnership arrangement around that, sharing budgets, how this can be tackled through commissioning. Lots of um, issues will um, be brought up, but it's through the actual mapping of the needs in each neighbourhood um, and, and, and experimenting. So, you, you know, you have to just go with what the need is. Um, things do change all the time um, to understand, um, you know, what the priorities are and, and what the ask is going to be. Yeah, I think it just, just saying that, I mean, it, it would strike me to have, you know, obviously you've got, you've got constraints and you've got to um, do what you can in the interim with your current asset base, but it'd be, it would always, I suspect it would be very helpful to actually go what more, what more you envisage could be done in, in a particular PCN, e.g. if you, I don't know whether you're going to dovetail in with sort of Chris's team to actually think actually what other assets are in that PCN and is there a case so so you, you you're doing what you can at the moment there's almost a second stage for each neighborhood and each pcn to think okay there are these other assets here could we make a case of that and then and then at least there's an idea that then the business case can then form around do you see what i mean i mean in an ideal yes. world that's i suppose that's why i would I'm hoping to come out of it because then at least that provides a, a real framework to start discussions forward kirsten are you gonna yeah, so I think that's absolutely what we'd like to do. Um, the work that the NEL team have done around estates, which um, is, they're doing it across NEL, but they've done a lot of work specifically around, you know, in each area, in each place, including City and Hackney. The, that's happened at a NEL level. Now that needs to get the local insight into, okay, so we've got that information, we've got that data that they put together. Now what is the local insight into actually what we need um, so that the idea is we've been in conversation with the, the, the NEL Estates team. They came to our last general practice strategy board to discuss this and the plan for taking that forward that they would then attend each neighbourhood leadership group, um, as Sadie outlined, to then get that local insight and, and then they'll progress it exactly as, as, you, as you have said. So we identify what we have, what more do we need, um, and, then, and then we can start talking to partners about how how we can make that happen. And to see the degree of prioritisation as to what's, what's the most, what, yeah. what, what's the most likely we can get off the ground first. Even. Yeah. Um, Councillor before. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, you said um, we need to unlock estates by understanding local needs and mapping resources in each location, negotiating access to space. Can the council assist you in this and how can that be assisted? Yes, I mean, I think it's everybody's business. Um, uh, I, th I suppose that, um, you know, all of this will be deliberated through the different level levels of decision making. So, um, obviously, the council is represented on the place based delivery group, the neighbours health and care board and the health and care board. The council are also represented in the leadership groups themselves. So there are people um, on the ground who are working in certain areas within adult social care, within um, some of this strategy policy and strategy team as well, who come to the leadership groups. So I think all of the spaces are quite well resourced to um, yet do this unlocking, supported by the Nell Estates team and supported by a dedicated post to drive through some of this working. And then, is there, from the Nell Estates team, is there an appetite to put capital funding in? Is there, no, is there, is there a, I mean, William, I mean, is, is there an ability to put capital funding in to make it happen um, once a need's identified? Or are we still, or is that still the elephant in the room that we don't necessarily have the capital? Yeah, Chair, I think that is Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I guess I would also go back and say, go back to you, to you all and say, at what point do you think it would be useful to get the council involved in those discussions? Would it be at a neighbourhood level and in those discussions of the leadership groups, or would it be useful for us to then 
bring those those discussions together in as a city in Hackney plan and come back to the council. I think that that's also it because you know it depends on what level people want to get involved. I mean, we're yeah. all up for collaboration, and we've seen how it can happen. It depends on what granular level you want to have that to happen. I mean, okay, obviously, Councillor Kennedy, maybe Chris Pritchard can come in, but I just, I just. And others stand to be by, by others better and more experienced view, but I'd have thought there needs to be some understanding of what the need is from your perspective first before we can then respond or strategize on that. I would have thought, but I mean, I, I think in the slide deck, the we have a, a map really of what the need is, and it's it's quite simple in terms of the space. Do you mean the kind of space that is required and what? what is required in terms of space is that is that your question well, I, think, I think it's just a clear understanding as to what the obviously part one you make do what you've got but what is your what is your realistic ask or suggestion mm -hmm. in it possibly in conversation with knowing what assets are available for what it could look like i think our our wish our uh, plan is to have a neighborhood hub in each neighbourhood that is a known space for residents, staff um, and community leaders to collaborate around addressing health inequalities and bringing care into the community and closer to where uh, people need it in a way that is um, personal, non-stigmatised, um, that is the ask, yeah, to have a community hub. Yeah, but then I suppose it's sort of what's the specific? Does that look like? Is that associated with the lead practice of the PCN? If it, do you know what I mean? It's that sort of just real clarity of understanding as to what's being. Do you see what I mean? Because I mean, that's that that you could see that's maybe slightly vague. I mean, do you want to do you want that in the in the building of the main with the the lead practice of the PCN or not or how how? You know, I don't know, the specificity of the ask, I suppose, is would, I don't know, from my perspective, and obviously other people specialise in this more. When you look at the research that we've done this year across the country, you've got where it, it is very much looking at the opportunities that people have. So you have some examples of PCN space, so GP practice space being co-located by other services, um, including voluntary sector working in there, or you have um, NHS buildings that are dedicated to a neighbourhood team that are hot desking, and then you have um, community spaces being used. And um, I think in every place, they are taking a neighbourhood by neighbourhood approach, certainly across London. Well. We're everywhere they're doing that and that makes sense that is place-based working but the actual space required is yes somewhere that is um that residents are able to meet where there is hot desking opportunity a team possibly could be located you could do assessments you can have group meetings um and uh, mdm meetings and some one-to-one -one space for assessments and that would make a huge difference um, to driving forward neighbours working. Councillor Arabeo and then Sally Bevan. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. We all know that Acne is planning to build more house in the uh, in Acne. So, is there any plan to? Now I'm talking about looking into the future to uh, put this forward to the council so that this can be factored into all this new bill in the in the local neighborhood. And I mean the capital project, the building, because you say you need a space, uh, you know, a hub, a community hub. So, yeah, I, th I think that, I mean, obviously, say you can come in, but I think what they're talking about, as I understand it, is a mapping exercise that's going to be taking place over the next six months or the year that could then feed into that sort of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, if, is, is, that, is, that, is that broadly right, that then that feeds into what 
what could be an ask or a suggestion for local yeah tourism? yeah so we're starting you know we're we we're, we're bringing together strategic leadership decision making with local hyper local needs you know this will involve the the neighborhood resident forums um this is the work to do um so so the answer is yes sally Thank you. No, not not so much much a question. More more just a, a comment in support of the idea of the the neighbourhood hubs. Uh, just to say that from the work we do with residents and what we see and what we're seeing at the moment, actually using St Leonard's with our public reps in that way. If you've got a hub in each neighbourhood that's there, not just when the forums are happening, but that's kind of a, a home for that na that neighbourhood hub. Your ability to bring residents in and work and work regularly with them and do lots more co produce work. I, I just think that will be a huge. A huge boost to the neighbourhoods project and I get I guess again more more of a comment I'm assuming that but if that goes forwards that will be work that you're co-producing with residents right from the start about yeah, sorry Katie I'm trying to um, um, see, um, see happening all stage um I think I'm muted Sharon hang on sorry two minutes the happening all stage um is tomorrow Sharon Sharon hang on can you put yourself on mute, please? Sharon's multitasking in two meetings. Um, <laughs> um, okay, um, so I'm going to thank you, Sadie. I'm going to uh, because we've got, we've got two further presentations. So can I now bring in um, uh, Chris and David from the council, and then Annabelle? I'm going to come to you um, from a Homerton perspective. Um, um, in due course as well um so uh i don't know chris david who wants to, to, to start off i think richard's already sort of uh, trailed it a bit but maybe could you just explain about some of the success stories we've had um with the portico and belfast road um well i'll introduce this then chair if that uh, if that suits um, I'll introduce myself first, in fact. My name's Chris Pritchard. I'm Hackney's Director of um, Property. Um, and just as a bit of useful context, uh, I'm responsible for about 700 different assets, and, and that includes all sorts of things from schools to 400 commercial and voluntary and community sector buildings, um, depots, town halls, office space, libraries, um, and, and so on um and the reason i think we've been able to enjoy such a, a successful and thoroughly rewarding partnership actually with um ccg and later icb colleagues over the last six years is that um as, as my colleague david is on the call will we'll confirm um he he's a part of a wider team because we have all these assets of different types we have a property department that has just about every real estate discipline within it so there's real depth so where david's been able to um work with richard so successfully he's been able to draw on the wider team skills as and when we've required them um as well um so to give you a flavor of some of the things we've done they have been alluded to already but um uh the first thing we did in in helping the uh, the ccg was to collate and prepare an asset register of all their surgeries um we've done space utilization review and um handed back as was mentioned earlier uh, void accommodation to nhs property services uh relocation of the wick practice to kenworthy road which richard alluded to um we applied for and and secured 150,000 of um, one public estate funding for um healthcare demand and capacity analysis at st leonard's um and we have secured around 280,000 of section 106 funding for the primary care projects. Um, we have also got um, to Reba stage two um, on expansion options for the John, John Scott Health Center. Um, and we have um, done a fair bit of work on potential redevelopment project at Summerford Grove. And indeed the Trowbridge practice uh, where we've looked at um, a range of potential relocation and development options um, at the same time, and and all of this has has been possible because we've had access t 
to um, Richard Ball and plenty of his time and plenty of his knowledge. Uh, and and it's, it's led to a genuinely very, very productive, efficient um, partnership, I, I would suggest. Um, that brings me on to um, the, the two capital projects that we've talked about. Um, principally, as you were sort of probing um, earlier, Chair, this was possible because a CCG had um, had had the awareness of their demand and their need. Um, they had the resource and the uh, willpower in in Richard Bull to to work with us. And of course, we we brought the ability to borrow, um, so we could bring the capital. Um, and of course, we had the expertise in house to to know what to do with that and how to set up the sort of satisfactory contractual arrangements that would protect um, the council. Uh, the CCG and the GP practices um, in setting up a, a genuinely professional and, and proper arrangement that will make it work in the long term. Um, so, as you know, not wanting to go into too much detail here, and, and if you do want um, more detailed um, advice and information on this, I'm sure David would be delighted to uh, to fill you in. But the the portico, which is um, some of you may not know, it's a it's a Grade Two listed um building in clapton uh which we are refurbishing and extending uh so that we can provide 18 new consulting rooms six treatment rooms and uh, a minor procedures room on site the belford belfast road site which is up um just behind um, stoke newington station will provide 20 consulting rooms um three treatment rooms and a minor procedures room again um and and I had a tour of the almost complete buildings quite recently uh, with some of the GPs and uh, and the mayor of Hackney. And I, I've got to say, I, I I don't think I've been in a primary care facility like that before. It's it's when you can have access to that capital and you can work with informed parties, um, the the sort of product that you can produce is is just superb and genuinely transformational. And and that is an overused um, word these days, but I I'm quite happy to use it in this case. Um, and then, of course, as we referred to and explored a little earlier, we've been doing a lot of work on the uh, potential of um, making improvements to 92 Well Street to accommodate um, a, a, a much more space and uh, superior space for relocating greenhouse GP surgery and um, the Homeless Prevention Service Hub. Um, so, so that's a bit of a whistle through what we've been doing. And as I say, I'm, I'm just delighted that we have that opportunity to do it. Um, there's one thing I'd, I'd add, actually, um, following on from the previous discussion just now. Um, strategic property, which is my department in Hackney, is just commencing our next asset management strategy. Um, and as everybody is very aware, um, local government, like any other public service at the moment, is having to look very, very carefully at its assets and how it continues to fund its services in the face of um, the need for further cuts. Um, and of course, we have to take that approach to our estates all the time. Um, and I'll be looking across all of our um, sites. And of course, school sites are under pressure as well at the moment with falling roles. So we're, we're finding we have surplus assets there as well. But there, we, we have a number of assets which I would describe as um, non-core. They don't accommodate uh, the direct provision of council services necessarily they're not there to earn us an income um we, we we've got a, a really interesting mix and we're constantly looking how we can better use those so as part of this process we're um refreshing our needs analysis with internal departments whether that's adult social care regeneration um children's services uh, to make sure that 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 everything we do have and everything we retain is 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 generating maximum value for the council and in the right parts of the borough and um with reference to uh the pcn conversation and so forth and and understanding their requirements now would be a great time for us to to get cracking on that and and forming a, a more detailed understanding of um health partners um requirements in the borough if that's of interest as i say we're at the start of that process and it'd just be terrific to um to work together as we go through that over the next 12 months or so um there is a a, a final um slide in this presentation which uh, Natalie brought and our chief planner would have um 
delivered if she could have been here. So um, I'll, I'll just take you through that very quickly. And um, if you've got any detailed questions, uh, I'm afraid I'm probably not the guy to give it to you. But um, this was a quick update on the on the um, policy um, uh, context in Hackney at the moment. Um, I don't know if you have access to these slides. I'm sure you do. Uh, but it, it's worth flagging that the main policy in the Hackney local plan um, dealing with community facilities is LP8, the social and community infrastructure. And um, in the supporting text, it does state that the 2018 infrastructure delivery plan has identified the need for additional GP capacity within the borough up to 2033. So as well as the Portico and Belfast Road developments, there have been discussions at various levels regarding works to other existing facilities, such as the Summerford Grove practice, the John Scott Centre, which I alluded to already, uh, Lower Clapton Health Centre, and previously the use of Stamford Hill Library as a, as a PCN. Um, the council does need to work with a network of bodies such as the NHS North East London Integrated Care Board, East London Health and Care Partnership and HS Property Services to take account of their plans and strategies, which is what I've just been alluding to, and uh, type of facilities and services, including GPs, needed to improve the health and well-being of the local population. So pretty standard stuff um, and well rehearsed already tonight. Um, we will work to review Hackney's local plan um, and, and that is due to start towards the middle and the end of 2024. Um, it, it will include an update of the infrastructure delivery plan and that takes into account the 2021 census and the latest population and development projections so hopefully that's a useful bit of context if anybody's got any questions be delighted to um uh, to address those thanks chris so just, just on those couple of points there in terms of the asset review that um your team's going to undertake in the next 12 months do you need any input resource to, to, to take into account to, 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 to have in your mind or whoever's conducting that to have in their mind the GP or PCN need when you're undertaking that review what what more do you need from if anything from NHS colleagues or others to enable you for that that to be a proper strand of your review now i appreciate them there are then business cases and capital things that need to be worked through to make yeah. that happen but to actually understand mapping it out what more do you need from nhs colleagues um if i give you an example of what we're doing internally then um with adult social care obviously we're trying to help them to um convert their perception of what's going to be required of their service um in the coming years and to convert that into an understanding of the space they need and health colleagues may actually have that understanding already they may be able to translate their requirements into a number of square meters or the type of facilities uh and environment that they need um and so it, it really depends on the quality of information that partners have already as to how much work needs to be done so i would suggest that in the first instance um a consistent point of contact um and someone who has time and access and and a good view and understanding of um the quality of information that exists that that's the priority for us at the moment i think and and i would suggest that's how why we've managed to achieve so much in the past six years because of course um Richard brought all of that. He had a rich understanding of the space requirements. He had a rich understanding of the operator's requirements. Um, and he spoke the language to some extent. So really, a point of contact uh, where we can get the best information available in terms of space requirements. And um, and and we can have a look at that. And, and we can establish from that whether there's any more work required or what type of work might be required and, and maybe make some suggestions as to who and how we could do that i mean it, it, curse and william i mean it, with richard's departure and whatever i mean are you able to sort of carry that baton <laughs> yeah i mean i mean going forward i mean because if we want to drive this forward i mean it strikes from a council perspective you need to you want to be in on this asset review at an early stage don't you i suppose well, I mean, I'm absolutely happy to be, I want to be involved. Um, 
do I have Richard's expertise? No, um, but um, in his absence, um, I, I certainly would be welcome to be involved and certainly can involve my primary care colleagues and indeed the PCM colleagues and neighbourhood colleagues as well. Yeah, I, I think what Chris is saying is, I mean, have the, 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 the ease of having a single point of contact, who has that knowledge, um, is, is helpful, so yeah. So I mean yes. So I mean I mean the extension. William, did you want to come in there? Yeah, it was just. I mean again, obviously uh, we're we're not able to to, uh, to 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 recruit to another Richard, but um, we are we will be having a head of primary care um, once we're able to go out to recruit. So there will be a kind of a a head of primary care with for City and Hackney. But again, I'm very happy to be. I don't. I obviously won't have as much time as Richard um, had. I, I now cover seven seven boroughs um but again very happy to have a conversational support and obviously there are other parts of northeast london icb such as louise and our our kind of strategic asset managers that that can support it but as as you say we we need to make sure that we we develop our eyes and the and the ears on the ground within city and hackney and working with our clinical leads um on the ground and pcns uh, cds and uh, etc to to really kind of like say understand what the ask is one thing i would say um to colleagues on the call is around just that affordability um from point of view of when we are developing new schemes and looking at what the ask is um that will be our will be one of the big issues the icb will face um due to the financial constraints we're under um so it's just really kind of early heads up of 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 actually i think that the sum of it will be very much about that that financial envelope that we will or won't be able to uh partake in some of the the offers i mean i, I suppose it's a staged approach isn't it i suppose it's wanting to get in there at, at an early stage in terms of understanding what assets are there have, have uh, isn't it? And, and and then and then 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 business cases could be worked out. but i suppose we're then back to the issue of even if the council can provide capital it needs to be paid for over a period of time with greater revenue and is the ics willing to make that commitment these are the other commitments i suppose is where it comes back to but at least at least we've got if, if we're in that conversation early um so yes so i mean as much as we can ask then um Chris and person, if you sort of maybe take over from, I don't know, take, take over to, to, to sort of like that that relationship with Chris in, in the in the in the short term, and then if I don't know, to, to, to sort of keep 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 that while well, Chris's team are doing it, then at least you've got your foot in the door, I suppose, for, for for that. And I suppose the other thing is just being also being mindful of the time scales for the um, local plan and trying to influence. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, it, trying to trying to influence that agenda as well in terms of need. So you've got two big council sort of reviews going on that you could possibly benefit from, but it's just being aware of those timescales, I suppose, and those reviews. Um, colleagues, is, colleagues, any um, questions on this? Council reform. Yeah, sorry, thanks. Uh, yeah, you allude to Hackney Council local um, plan update. Work starting in September, in, in summer 24. How can NHS be more meaningfully involved in writing the update on infrastructure delivery plan? And how can they be engaged on, the, on this project earlier? I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, is it largely what we've been discussing about being involved earlier? It's sort of getting in the door of the local plan and with the conversation with, with Chris's team now in terms of the asset review, I think, are the two, are the two, yeah, the, 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 the two key points. Yeah. Yes, I think, I think, Councillor Adams. Sorry, Chair, is this the last presentation? Or the... Okay. That's, I've got a question about St. Leonard's, that's why. I had flagged up a question. So with that then, um, um, thank you, um, Chris. Can I come now, can I bring Annabelle in from the um, Homerton, from your perspective? We've touched a lot on um, the, the, the primary care outlook. I mean, as far as we're concerned, the background, as far as the Homerton was concerned, is pre-COVID, 
there was obviously an estate's plan, possibly with talk of mental health beds moving to Mile End in exchange for greater surgical um, capacity at the Homerton. But as I understand it, that's very much sort of on the on the back burner and possibly behind the acute collaborative work in terms of assessing that. So are you able to give some sort of um, um, give us some sort of idea about what the Homerton's looking at in terms of estate work um, in, in Hackney? Um, I'll, I'll pass to my colleague Tony in a minute um, about the specifics of estates as he's from the estates team, although uh, just a caveat that he has recently started, so you might have to come back with uh, specifics. Um, but I just wanted to um, also echo some of the things that have been said and say um, it's really positive to hear these collaborative conversations going on. So Homerton is committed to moving more care closer to patients' home, out of hospital care, and also reminded that we're not just an acute trust. We are funded partly by public health. We already have lots of examples of co-location with children's centres, office space co-location, public health funded services like um, health visiting that already work in primary care and primary care funded roles like the additional roles um so we're really keen to um work collaboratively on this um, neighborhood estates issue we feel it very keenly ourselves as well because we are full up at the homerton our outpatients are full up so we want to move more out into the community and um, we have some great examples where that's happening already and collaboration with the community and voluntary sector too so we have like um sadie described the adult therapies clinics we have other clinics that are happening in voluntary spaces where then patients can come and also get a food bank also meet the voluntary sector and get tied into lots of other things so real um, outreach, preventative care, health inequalities work um, that we're really behind. So absolutely we want to be partners in this um, going forward. Um, but I'll pass over to Tony. Um, if you're there, Tony, I think you are. Before we bring um, Tony and Annabelle, what did, uh, I, I don't quite know the extent to which the um, Homerton's capital budget but I mean, I mean, one observation would be in terms of line with that line of thinking you're thinking. I mean, would there be any scope? And this is not maybe for you to answer now, but to take back, but for the Homerton to consider any of its capital budget could be used to uh, fund development um, outside the hospital precinct itself but in, in the community i mean we already have a significant um community estate in different ways that we rent and tony can speak to that so i think we're definitely committed to utilizing and sharing and and thinking more creatively about what we have already i know that our capital budget is very stretched though um tony why don't you come in on on this yeah um to be honest we don't know what our capital budget is going to be yet so we we can't answer any of that then type of questions until we understand that stepping back i don't know what the estate strategy was previous to this but we're um just in the midst of um finishing off a theatre project where our free theatres are opening and that seems to be on schedule for um for handover in april and clinical handover just after that and we are running through i'm not sure the exact day but it's 2025 there's surgical day stays which is a capital project which may be what you was linking about that is still ongoing and being built and that's sitting um above the nelf area so that's being 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 done in conjunction um with nelf because we're impending on their areas but that is basically all i know if there's any specific questions being there i'd have to take it back and come back to you no, uh, thanks, Tony. It's also good to, good to hear about the um, three extra um, surgical capacity rooms. Um, um, that, that's 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 very welcome. Um, we've only got a few moments left, and I know Councillor Adams has a um, particular interest in St Leonard's, because it's in his um, ward. 
Chris, I, I think you know the background to this. Are you okay just to run through for Councillor Adams where we're up to um, on St Leonard's? There was obviously the, the possibility of essentially um, some development, but then essentially Propco pulled the agreement or the av availability of, of that being able to happen. So essentially we're back to square one, as I understand it. But you just able to Councillor Adams a, a brief update. Just checking which Chris that's directed at. You. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Right. Um, we've had a couple of goes at um, evaluating the viability of, of improving um, the site. Um, and, and the last time was with the help of um, the OPE and the form of the funding they gave us for um, to, to get some analysis done and, and so forth. And, and um, NHS estates had hoped that um, there's enough value in the land to to fund some expansion and refurbishment through um, margin to be made on housing development. But um, having had two goes at that and, and on both occasions being in a stronger market than we are now, um, we know that that on its own is not sufficient to, um, to deliver um, the, the capital required to, to um, develop that site further. Um, and of course, um, I think really, to be honest, the council was hopeful that um, the Homerton might take on the site and therefore bring it within their um, area of expertise. And of course, that hasn't um, hasn't materialised. Um, so we, there are very few, if any, levers that I can see that we can pull now um, to, to advance things at St Leonard's. Thanks, Chris. So I think I think I think that's there's no real update or news, sadly, in terms of that site um, on on a local level for the councillors or the residents. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, can I thank everyone for this um, um, discussion? It's certainly been um, incredibly helpful for us to understand um, where we're at. I think there's clearly in, clearly very much need at a PCN and GP level for greater capacity, um, and clearly I think a willingness from the um council to help support with this portfolio we might be back to that that question of the financing and how it's paid for over over a period um but if it's helped us i think to understand in more detail and also make representations for the need for that to be financed as well and the importance of that so certainly um um that, that that's very helpful and so it may well be that i think as, as, as a suggestion for us this is something that we could maybe um, review in a year or so's time to see um, when we've got greater idea of what the mapping of the need is and also if there's any um, understanding of the um, what assets are available to take it from there. And in the short term, um, hopefully, if, if there is greater financial leeway um, to get nice to Wealth Street off the ground as well, um, which is clearly something that's very tangible that can happen in the short term. Um, so thank you everybody um, for that and then with, with that item um, I'm going to draw that item to a close so thank you um, could I and, and just to finish off actually I think I think as Chris alluded Chris Pritchard alluded to it be a very good item I know Charlotte you suggest this as well for members to go and see these two new surgeries um, so we will organize a, um, a, a members um, a members visit to the, to the two of those um, moving on then can I item number six can I take the minutes of the previous me previous meeting as agreed please Councillor Adams, agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, work programme is item number seven as set out. I haven't been notified of any other business. Just to remind colleagues, we're doing a site visit to St Joseph's on Friday, the 26th of April. And with that, I close the meeting. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.